Our coverage of the war in the Gulf continues. I'm Jonathan Mann. And I'm Susan Rook. Here's the latest. The ground war has begun. This is nearly one million troops are arrayed in the Persian Gulf area. There are approximately 700,000 troops in the U.S.-led coalition. There are nearly 600 Iraqi troops in southern Iraq and Kuwait. At approximately 10 p.m. Eastern time, an hour and a half from now, President Bush gave the official word. We have been getting unofficial word for about an hour and a half before that, but President Bush gave the official word saying, quote, the liberation of Kuwait has now entered a final phase. I have complete confidence in the ability of the coalition forces to swiftly and decisively accomplish their mission. Their mission, of course, being the full and complete cl compliance with U.S. U.N. Resolution 660, the complete withdrawal of Iraqi troops from Kuwait. Jonathan? About 30 minutes after we heard from the president, it was the turn of the Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, who spoke to the press and over CNN. And he told us, we've undertaken a major military operation. I'm quoting here, allied military units are on the move. Their positions, movements, and placements must be carefully safeguarded. With those words, the Secretary of Defense announced what amounts to a news blackout on the pr process that we're about to see, or that is underway now. We do not expect to be learning a great deal more from official sources in the hours ahead as the war on the ground continues. Now, the Iraqi army has had a great deal of time to prepare for this offensive, more than six months, and they have been literally digging, it, digging in rather uh, one of their defenses, underground bunkers. We learn more about that now from CNN's Charles Hoff. Iraq purchased sophisticated weapons from around the world. It also bought know-how to protect both those weapons and the soldiers using them. Iraq built nearly 600 reinforced concrete and steel shelters for its planes. Often the bunkers have concrete walls in front to block missile attacks and are encased in sand for additional protection. To crack the shell of these hardened aircraft shelters, takes one aircraft's complete weapon load of laser-guided 1,000-pound bombs. But the proper bomb placement, combined with the delayed fuse set to explode after the bomb breaks through the roof, can destroy the shelters. Iraq also built shelters for some of its troops. An international group of shelter consultants believes the complex structures look like this. They're believed buried up to 50 feet under the desert and covered with a thick slab of concrete. They include medical, kitchen, and storage areas, and each might house a thousand soldiers. The bunkers are difficult to destroy. But a direct hit from a 2,000-pound shell fired by a U.S. battleship or a smart bomb aimed at a ventilation shaft can put a shelter out of commission. Also, some analysts believe Iraq shelters are not as complex or well-made as the consultants group believes. President Saddam Hussein himself likely has a special underground bunker. Somewhere under Baghdad, perhaps under the damaged presidential palace, may lie a multi-level bunker. Sources tell CNN it's actually more of a home and command center. From the bunker, President Hussein, his family and advisors could live, work, and control the Iraqi military. The bunker was built to withstand just about anything short of a nuclear strike. President Bush's spokesman says when the war ends, the world will see Iraq spent more money on bunkers and other military infrastructure than any country in history. Charles Hoff, CNN reporting. And now for reaction from the U.S. Congress, Patrick Leahy joins us. Sir, did you get word that this was going to take place? No, I don't think that anybody got a specific word, but I, I, I think we all realize this. I, uh, as I said uh, the other night, in fact, on your network, that as soon as the offer was made to Iraq, if they, uh, if they turned it down, and there was no question in anybody's mind that we would go very, very quickly uh, to, to a ground war, which is what the president did. In fact, I think... If anything, when the reports came out that uh, Kuwaitis were being summarily executed or rounded up, uh, I, I think President Bush, rightly so, decided then to move quicker rather than wait. CNN's Charles Bierbauer reports from the White House that the decisions to uh, authorize General Schwarzkopf to give him that so-called window of opportunity uh, was perhaps made as early as February 11th. Were you told then? Well, the, uh, the president has been very clear, those he has talked with, uh, that 
he would go to a ground war at a time when he thought it was most propitious to do so. Uh, he has been advised, I think pretty uniformly, uh, that uh, he, to use the air war as long as possible. Uh, but uh, he has made it very clear that when the military option was such to go to ground war, he would do it. I think that had there not been this flurry of activity on the part of Saddam Hussein this past week with the uh, Iraq and the Soviet Union, we would have gone to a ground war even a couple of days ago. I think the only thing that held it back was waiting to see if he would accept the U.S. ultimatum to pull out. He did not. And as soon as it, uh, he did not, as soon as the 12 o'clock deadline passed, it was then simply a time of when, when it would be best for the military to move. I don't think anybody had any question Senator, that we, we would go quickly to it. Senator, I remember the uh, congressional debates when uh, the House and Senate were considering the, uh, the authorization for President Bush to use full force. Can you assess uh, congressional reaction now that this war has entered a new and potentially very bloody phase? Well, Ms. Rick, as you know, that was a very closely divided Congress, uh, whether we should or should not go to war. But one thing everybody agreed on before we went to war there should be a congressional authorization to do so that vote was cast we authorized the president to go to war and the congress has been very strongly behind the president's uh, as commander-in-chief since then i would suspect that while everybody everybody would like to avoid a ground war and the casualties involved uh, I think that you're going to find very strong support from both Democrats and Republicans of President Bush at this time. You're not going to find the Congress trying to second guess uh, the commander in chief while, while the troops are in the field. Do you anticipate any change in that level of support or solidarity, if you will, in Congress if the length of the war continues past a week, two weeks, three weeks? No, I think that everybody knows that what's uh, uh, ahead and when the, the, really the decision was made at the time the debate was held to go to war. Uh, everybody had to know back in January that you had the potential for a bloody and long war. But we voted to go to war. And uh, now that that's happened, you're going to find the support. You're not going to find falling off of the support. In fact, what is probably far more important now is for the Congress and the President to start thinking about what happens after the war and, and start planning for what kind of reaction there'll be in the Middle East to have a lasting peace. If we don't do that, we'll be right back there doing the same thing five years or 10 years from now. And I think that you're going to find that there's going to be a real effort among the allies, the moderate Arabs, Israel, a no, number of other countries to set aside past preconceptions and past rhetoric and start planning for the future. If we don't, uh, then this whole thing becomes a very tragic problem. If we do plan, uh, then uh, we could say that we've actually achieved something. Senator Leahy, this has been, as you said, a tragic problem for quite some time. How do you see that this would change things? A lot of people have said that this effort could only make things worse. No, I think that uh, everybody realizes that Saddam Hussein, through a sense of megalomania, uh, and just some of the most vicious attitudes toward human life uh, cannot be allowed to, to continue. And we, books will be written about those who encouraged him in the past, including the United States, who sold him uh, arms and gave him billions of dollars in agricultural subsidies and so on. But the fact is uh, that the Middle East is a very dangerous place as long as he has the power uh, to be able to do whatever he wants. Once it is demonstrated he does not have that power, then the industrial nations, the arms producing nations have to work together to say let's cut back the number of arms we sell throughout the world and in the Middle East so that we don't have to come in and be the world's policeman when something happens. The moderate Arab nations have to understand that times are changing for them too and Israel has to understand that now finally the Israeli-Palestinian uh, problem has to be settled once and for all. That is the final word. Senator Patrick Leahy, thank, thank you. you very much for your time. Jonathan? For the latest from the Middle East, we go now to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where CNN's Mike Chinoy is standing by. It is just past daybreak, uh, 20 minutes to 8. Overnight, we are told, though, Mike, there were more Scud attacks. What can you tell us?
That's right, Jonathan. It was just about three hours ago when the sirens rang out in Saudi Arabia, another Scud missile was on its way. Two Patriot missiles were launched from a site in central Saudi Arabia. That was an American aircraft flying overhead. The U.S. Central Command says the Patriots intercepted the incoming Scud and a few seconds later... taking off from an airport here. A few seconds after the Patriots were launched, there was a loud explosion. When we got to the site, we found that an elementary school had taken a direct hit. There's some uncertainty whether it was a Scud warhead that hit or whether it was just debris falling from the sky. The term intercepting a Scud when used by the U.S. Central Command does not necessarily mean detonating that Scud warhead in the sky. The damage to the school was extensive. The whole interior of the building was destroyed. There were children's books and small chairs that had been blown out across the road. Luckily, though, there were no casualties, mainly because of the time of day. It was 4.30 in the morning here, but also because, even had it been later, most schools in Saudi Arabia remained closed because of the war situation. The Scud appeared to be Saddam Hussein's response to the Allies' deadline and to the launch of the ground war. You'll recall that just about the time the deadline expired, there was a scud that was launched towards Israel. The hope here now is that if the ground campaign goes well, the scud that was fired towards Saudi Arabia a couple of hours ago may be one of the last that the Saudis will have to endure. Mike Chinoy, CNN, reporting live from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Mike, of course, as you were telling us, and as we heard, planes going off in the background there. Has the pace of activity picked up a great deal since the ground war began? In looking back on it through the night, there certainly seemed to be more air activity that we could discern. Of course, we don't know precisely what all of these missions are. But people did notice what appeared to be an upsurge earlier in the evening, and then one could see some aircraft coming back early in the morning and it's a bit unusual to hear the plane zooming overhead at this hour in this number, as we just heard a few moments ago. So yes, there is a sense of greater activity, but given the news blackout, we're in no position to be able to say precisely what is being sent where and what their missions are. Mike, what about Kuwaitis themselves? A great many of them have taken refuge in Saudi Arabia. Is it too early for them to know what's going on? Have they had any reaction either the Kuwaiti refugees or the, or the servicemen in the, in the Kuwaiti Air Force? Well, the general sense among Kuwaitis that we talk to is one of relief and also great anxiety. They are very relieved that this final, hopefully final phase of the campaign to free their country from Iraqi control is now underway and there is a a palpable sense of excitement among many of them that soon they may be able to go home. At the same time, they have heard and also in some cases been the sources for the reports of the uh, so-called scorched earth policy that appears to be underway in Kuwait and many of them have friends and family still in Kuwait. They've obviously got to be terribly concerned about what the condition of civilians in Kuwait at this point must be between the uh, depredations of the Iraqis, the reports of mass arrests, executions, the environmental disaster caused by the torching of so many of Kuwait's oil installations, the already existing shortages of food and water, and now the massive amount of firepower being directed towards Kuwait by the Allies. It cannot be an easy situation for any civilian in Kuwait to be in, and yet there is a sense here that when this is all over, the Kuwaitis will get their country back, and therefore the ground campaign is worth it, whatever the sacrifices. CNN's Mike Chinoy reporting from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Thanks very much for that. I'm sure we'll be hearing from you again in the hours ahead. Susan? This just in from Reuters News Service, quoting the Kuwaiti News Agency. The report says that Allied forces have captured the small island of Felaka commanding the sea approach to Kuwait City. There were reportedly between 500 and 1,000 Iraqi troops stationed on the island. Those have reportedly been taken prisoner of war. Allied troops had been intensively bombing that island on the approach to Kuwait City intensively for the past week. Again, Reuters is quoting the Kuwaiti news agency as saying, Allied forces have captured the small island of Falaka, commanding the sea approach to Kuwait City. Our coverage of the war in the Gulf continues. I'm Susan Rook. I'm Jonathan Mann.
Saddam Hussein's last chance to withdraw from Kuwait without a land war has come and gone. The U.S.-led coalition has unleashed a massive ground attack on Iraqi forces. Word of the ground war came less than four hours ago. CNN's Mark Leff has our report. The first pictures of the second phase of Operation Desert Storm were familiar ones. Within minutes of the first reports that ground forces were pushing into Kuwait from Saudi Arabia, Iraq launched another long-range missile at the Saudi capital, met in the air by ground-to-air missiles and causing little damage. Moments later, U.S. President George Bush returned to the White House from the Maryland mountains to confirm that the so-called ground war had begun. The liberation of Kuwait has now entered a final phase. I have complete confidence in the ability of the coalition forces swiftly and decisively to accomplish their mission. To the extent that we uh, had a specific planning date in mind uh, for some period of time now, uh, it was uh, this particular day and uh, a particular hour. While smoke from Iraqi-set oil fires covers much of Kuwait and part of the Persian Gulf, one U.S. pilot Friday reported Kuwait City itself remained largely untouched from the air. Not so the suburbs, though. And some of the pilots who've been looking at Iraqi targets from the air for more than a month say there are still plenty of them to hit. It's just horizon to horizon of tanks, APCs, armored vehicles, trucks, and they're not hard to pick out at all. Uh, we probably knock out uh, two to three tanks per F-18 per sortie. So we're doing real good work. But men from one Marine unit that briefly went into Kuwait well before the major offensive found the Iraqi forces facing them were still able to fight back. They're not as weak as everybody's making them out to be. We got a couple miles within the berm, and they started firing mortar rounds randomly. We were in a tactical convoy, and they were firing at angles all over the place. And then finally, about the, I counted three, and then when the fourth one hit, it hit our vehicle. And at that time, took all our gear and pushed it to the front of the vehicle. And that's when it pushed him up into the windshield on the driver's side, and me up into the windshield on the passenger side. Yeah, I was really amazed that, that neither one of us were killed because it was, you know, it was, a, it was a scary thing. At United Nations headquarters in New York, Security Council members had met on and off through the day, trying to reconcile the Iraqi Soviet withdrawal plan the U.S. had rejected with the U.S. ultimatum Iraq had rejected. But now, looking only at what it can do after a ground war, not before it. And from Iraq's perspective... I think it, it will be a long war. Mark Leff, CNN, reporting. We've received news that all briefings for today have been canceled. And the indications are right now that there will be a 48-hour news blackout on the ground phase operations. Reporting live from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Rick Salinger, CNN. Susan? Rick, I understand the uh, news blackout right now, but CNN's military analyst, General Perry Smith, had said earlier, pointed out that perhaps the orders had been given for these Scud launches at Saudi Arabia and Israel yesterday. Perhaps those orders had been given some time ago and not had an opportunity to be rescinded, that perhaps this is not connected in any way to the current Allied ground offensive. Are officials there telling you anything about that possibility? Well, they certainly can't tell us what is on the mind of the Iraqis and whether or not their orders had come some time earlier. What they have been saying, however, is they've been hitting hard at the Iraqi command and control centers, trying to do away with all forms of communication between Baghdad and the Kuwaiti theater of operations. Uh, the timing does seem to be more than coincidental that it would come at the beginning of the ground war almost to the minute but really at this point there's no way of saying whether it was planned in advance or whether it was a reaction to the allied push officials there of course are planning for possibly massive iraqi defections massive uh, amounts of iraqi prisoners of war what facilities are being ready to take care of them you're absolutely right. They have planned on mass defections, mass prisoners of war, and so huge and numerous prisoner of war camps have been set up. We asked at one point how many prisoners of war they would be able to accommodate. The figure we were given, 100,000. 
CNN's Rick Salinger keeping us up to date from Saudi Arabia. Well, David, let me say, first of all, I think it clearly is a time for bipartisanship. I've said that from the very outset. Uh, I happen to be one who has supported the president from the outset. I think he has done a superb job uh, from the very beginning in terms of marshalling the international community behind this effort. Uh, the decisions that he made, in, in my judgment, are, are basically right. They're courageous. I think it's a time for all of us to close ranks. There'll, there'll be plenty of time to sort out any politics that are involved down the road. All the votes will be preserved. All the speeches will be preserved. Uh, any uh, reactions to uh, any of the events that have taken place will be there. But between now and the time this operation is completed, I think that you'll see on both sides of the aisle, I, I see no real uh, divergence at this point. Uh, d Democrats and Republicans alike have closed ranks behind the president, behind the troops. We're going to support them all the way. And, and I hope that that uh, continues uh, certainly through the end of this operation. Uh, as I say, there'll be plenty of time to sort out the politics later. And looking toward the end of the operation, do you have an idea uh, how long we'll have to stay in the region, what kind of a mopping up effort it will be, how long a security force would be necessary in the region? And are American taxpayers, in other words, looking at an open purse for a long time to come over this or not? Well, it's going to be expensive. I think the president and Dick Cheney and Colin Powell and everyone else who's had anything to say about it has indicated, acknowledged the fact that it's going to be expensive and it's going to take a long period of time. Uh, I would hope that in a relatively brief period, a period of months, that we can get most of the U.S. ground forces out of the area, turn it over to a U.N. peacekeeping force that would made up of the international community, hopefully with uh, almost uh, exclusive uh, Arab uh, contingents in this particular region uh, at an appropriate time. But it is even if, if there were no fighting, if there were no uh, enemy in the area, it would take us a, a period of months to, to simply uh, withdraw all of the troops and equipment that are in the area right now. So the thought that even if this operation concludes very quickly as we hope that it will, that our troops can all come home right away it is, is a bit uh, unrealistic. Uh, the, the, the real hope now is that we can conclude the, 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 uh, the heavy fighting, hopefully conclude all the military action, and then it'll simply be a matter of setting up a peacekeeping force, cooperating with the forces in the region. It's clear that, that uh, uh, King Fahd and, and the, the Saudis uh, do not want us to remain in the area any longer than we have to. I think for a variety of reasons that would be unwise, but I think in the short term we're clearly going to have to be a part uh, of any uh, resolution of, of the uh, uh, infrastructure that uh, has to be pl put in place to uh, transition from what has been a uh, almost exclusively military situation recently to what would hopefully become a much more peaceful uh, civilian situation in the near term. Senator Robb, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I know it is uh, early in the morning and we thank you for coming in. Thank you very much. Jonathan. David, we go now to what may be the center of the storm, Baghdad, the capital of Iraq, of course, and CNN's Christian Amanpour, who's standing by live. Christian. Good morning, Jonathan. In Baghdad, you would hardly know, you would not know at all that a ground offensive has started. It's been an extremely quiet night. There have been no air raid uh, sirens, an extremely quiet morning. Of course, the last thing we did hear here in terms of activity was on the dot of the deadline, 8 p.m. our time last night. Huge, huge explosions, a uh, massive noise, but nothing since then. As far as the news from here goes this morning, there's no, nothing in the official press. There's been nothing on Baghdad radio. The last um, broadcast from Baghdad Radio was a few hours ago, mentioned nothing about a ground offensive starting. In fact, repeated the rather defiant um, statement from the Vice Chairman of the Revolutionary Command Council last night, who said, in effect, they were rejecting the U.S. ultimatum, that um, Iraq wanted peace, but the ultimatum shows that the United States was not being realistic about it. So that's about the news um, here today. Of course, um, when the air war started, it was a much different matter. This was a target, and everybody knew about it. Um, it's not unusual, however, for Baghdad Radio to keep these kinds of things um, off the air until they have more details, until they're ready, until the government is ready to formulate a response. Um, we do know, however, that yesterday on Baghdad Radio and all evening, they were preparing the people for a ground war. They kept saying that um, Iraq is ready to fight, that the forces are ready, and already Baghdad Radio and the military communiques had over the last few days claimed the ground war had started and already Iraq was claiming victory. So that's the latest from here. Christian, before you go, we understand, of course, that you're working under relatively strict censorship. Can you tell us, though, has there been any indication in all of the quiet that seems to prevail there, uh, any indication of troop movements or any military activity from the Iraqi side? Absolutely not at all. Um, certainly not from the Baghdad area. I can say that freely here. Um, 
and obviously we haven't been down towards the front, we haven't been able to go to the main roads and, and, and supply routes and things, we haven't been able to see any of that, so I can't comment on that, but from around here you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that anything was going on. Okay, in a related vein, what about political activity, political maneuvering, now that it looks like the last days of Saddam Hussein's government may, uh, may be the days ahead? Well, that's going to be the interesting thing, to wait and see um, uh, how, how this shakes down, how he survives. As I say, he's been keeping a very low profile. The last thing we heard was a speech um, a couple of nights ago where he was uh, quite defiant, although saying he wanted peace, quite defiant, saying that if there was a ground war, Iraq was uh, ready to um, ready to go for it and ready to, as, as they put it, repel the enemy forces. Yesterday, all we know is that he chaired a, um, a meeting of the command council for the latest development. Um, and, and as we know, he, he gave um, Terry Gazin, the foreign minister, the, the permission that to negotiate a, and to accept an unconditional withdrawal according to the Soviets. Uh, that's about as far as I guess he thought he could go. There's a saying here in the Arab world that it is better to go down in flames than in shame. Perhaps that's what uh, the deal is right now. It is, it seems, uh, 8.25 or so in the morning. They're still pretty early. Have you been out in the streets and have you had an opportunity just to talk to ordinary Iraqis and perhaps share information that you have that they don't about this ground war? We haven't had an opportunity, but that's the next thing on our agenda. As you know, we are, are under restrictions of movement. We can't uh, move outside until we have escorts with us. And um, people are just about getting geared up for that kind of thing now. There are trips planned around today. Um, some around the country outside of the city and you know we're planning on, on going off on some of those and we'll be able to talk to people but um, from our talks with people in the streets yesterday and over the last few days although of course everybody expressed the hope that this wouldn't come to a ground war many people um, were expecting that it would they had um, all pinned a lot of hope on the Soviet proposal and when the word was filtering in that it, it basically wasn't good enough for, for the Allies a lot of people were basically sort of feeling themselves towards what would come. And, and the feeling on the street from people and from officials that we are able to talk to, the feeling is that um, Iraq, while it doesn't want the war, it also does not want to be humiliated. There's still a fierce pride here, so despite the realities of what may or may not be their military positions, they take a very fierce um, pride and they, they maintain that they're ready to fight and can do it. Now, can you tell us if the supply of services may have been interrupted in any way? Is electricity and other forms of power even rarer than it was before? Is water even rarer than it was before? Any change in living conditions over these last few hours? Not at all. Not at all. As, uh, I can speak only to the Baghdad area. We, as you know, there have been power outages for the last several weeks. I mean, basically there's no electricity except for what is generated by private generators. Um, water is, is very intermittent. The water flow, there's a couple of hours a day, there, there is water, but nothing has changed over the last few hours. Any, any further indication of whether your own conditions are going to be changing? You're, it sounds like you're operating pretty well the, the way you did yesterday, under close Iraqi control, but, uh, but except for that, pretty much business as usual for you and the, the, the rest of the Western Press Corps. If I heard you correctly, any, do I think there'll be any change in our position? Um, I can't tell. Uh, we, we carry on under the restrictions that, that we've been carrying on under for the last um, several weeks. Um, as I say, we, when we asked to make the phone call, there was immediate permission to do so. Um, it's really a, a question of wait and see. Okay, Christian Amanpour, thanks very much for that live report from Baghdad, and take good care.